Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Fanton, president of the New School for Social Research, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the keynote address session for In the Company of Animals. This conference is the third in a series of projects organized by our journal Social Research, which addresses uh, contested social issues uh, from many different perspectives in public uh, occasions like this and by means of exhibits mounted uh, at collaborating New York City museums. We're grateful to Arian Mack, the uh, talented editor of Social Research, whose energy and imagination and hard work uh, made this uh, conference uh, happen. I'd like a round of applause for Arian. The first in our series, called In the Time of Plague, the History and Social Consequences of Lethal Epidemic Diseases, included a public conference here at the New School and a collaborative exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History. In the Time of Plague, considered how societies, both past and present, respond to these kinds of catastrophes, particularly the current AIDS uh, epidemic. Uh, we believe that recalling and reflecting on how such threats were dealt with in other times can lead to a uh, more effective public response to uh, AIDS in our own time. The second project, Home, A Place in the World, involved a collaboration with five New York City museums. In that uh, project, we explored the values, uh, ideas, images, history, and experience of home in order to deepen our understanding and appreciation of what it means to have a home, to belong, but also to understand better what it means not to have a home, not to have a homeland, that is, to be homeless and nationless. Our present endeavor in the company of animals is an exploration of the relationship between humans and other animals. In addition to this conference, it also includes exhibits and public programs at the Pierpont Morgan Library, the Museum for African Art, the Asia Society, and the Jewish Museum, as well as a reading of animal poetry organized by the uh, Academy of American Poets, which will take place in our Swedak Auditorium uh, tomorrow evening. There are some ideas and events in human history which are self-evidently important. The rise of nationalism, revolutions, development of technology, but there are other critical issues which are obscured by their familiarity and proximity to us. And one of those issues is the relationship between ourselves and other animals. Throughout history and in all places, animals have been an important part of human culture. They've been hunted and domesticated, befriended and eaten, worshiped and feared, romanticized and demonized, studied and mythologized. Beliefs about our relationships with them have been continuous and are expressed in our traditions, our language, our arts and literature, our religions, and in our sciences. And the ways in which we explain our relationship with animals reflect uh, uh, something about uh, our, self, uh, our sense of who we are. And because contemporary uh, attitudes have deep roots uh, in the past and stem from the very different ways in which animals figure in our lives, an important aspect of this project is to illuminate the close relationship between how we live and the ways in which we understand our relationships to animals uh, over time and across geography. Now that relationship is not without controversy and you will undoubtedly have noted that the conference concludes with a policy discussion uh, which uh, will wrestle with some of the vexing questions concerning our responsibilities toward other creatures, such as whether and under what conditions it might be morally acceptable to use animals in scientific research. We deliberately place this discussion at the end of the conference in the belief that the scholarship brought to bear on the topic over the next two days may well bring badly needed new perspectives to the issue and provide us with uh, a reasoned context for an intelligent policy discussion that in turn may lead uh, to sensible policy decisions. It's now my very special privilege to introduce the keynote speaker for In the Company of Animals. Stephen J. Gould is, I'm delighted to say, an honorary alumnus of the New School, having received our Doctor of Humane Letters degree in 1986. 
Uh, we claim Professor Gould's kinship in other ways as well. He's a New Yorker by birth and a graduate of our neighbor, Columbia University, where he received his PhD in 1967. That year, he uh, joined the faculty of Harvard University as a, an assistant professor of geology, and he's remained there through a long and distinguished career. In 1973, he was appointed full professor, as well as curator of an invertebrate paleontology in the Museum of Comparative Zoology, and in 1982, uh, he uh, assumed a distinguished chair in geology. It's nearly impossible to identify a scientist or humanistic thinker who spent more time in the company of animals than Professor Gould. And because he's com combined profound knowledge of life on Earth with rich social and ethical values and a great gift of writing and communication, he has no doubt charted uh, the course for many of you who have in your careers devoted much time to thinking about our relationship with animals. Professor Gould's books and other writings have made a major, major contribution to our understanding of the subject and have garnered for him numerous awards, including the National Book Award for Science in 1981, given for his work, The Panda's Thumb, and the National Book Critic Circle Award in 1982 for The Mismeasure of Man. I'm going to stop right here because if I went on and listed all the honors and accomplishments, you would never hear from him. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you uh, Professor Stephen J. Gould. Hey, Mr. President, who's taller than me? How does this go down? Uh, <laughs> now, you said it does. It's a full service. Uh, oh, all right. All you have to do is read, it says. <laughs> no, I to, I to do okay. Right. Yep. Thanks. We all know the conclusion to that most famous of all poems about invertebrates, namely Robert Burns's To a Louse. The louse speaks from its position in a hairpiece of an upper class lady, if I remember correctly. I tried my best Scots accent, except seeing the trouble Mr. D'Amato is in at the moment. <laughs> The similar attempts, I won't. I bleed for him. <laughs> oh, would some power the gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. It would from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. Very familiar lines that you all know. Apparently, unfortunately, no such power exists. And so everything we know about animals, we see in our terms. And especially, I mean, everything we see in our terms, but especially about animals who are genuinely kindred. I will discuss questions of pomology, or that evolutionary sense in which they are, in a bit. And therefore, we make many a blunder and foolish notion. I want to begin with a series of slides, which is more or less symbolic of some of the issues of the errors we make, and seeing everything in our terms, not only as representatives of human forms and features, but how we have a preference for seeing things in our own scale, which is only one scale among many in nature. And when we're deprived of knowledge about the actual scale, we get all confused. These first few photos are from a book I did with a wonderful photographer, Rosalind Purcell, several years ago called Illuminations. So we'll look at the first, and then you'll get the metaphorical meaning of why I'm showing them. The, the point is, and this is only... I, I, I assume you realize the only reason why Archimbaldo's paintings work, and we see faces there when he's made them out of books or toads or flowers or pieces of wood, is that we are programmed, that's literally so, to see faces and particularly to recognize human faces. That's not a metaphor. It's just so interesting how often we get fooled. I'll show you a couple of whimsical ones and a couple of more serious ones. This is the underside of a turtle's carapace, looking at the backbone attached to the carapace, but we see the two eye spots I don't have a point to do it, no. And the, uh, what looks like a mouth, which is just the junction between two vertebrae. And so it just amuses us, because we see the face there, which of course isn't. Or this one, which are the eye spots. At least these may actually have an adaptive function in nature of fooling and scaring other predators away. You think it is a large animal because of the eye spots. But these are on the wing of moths, Samia moths. And then a little more sinister, this looks for all the world like the death's head on a New England gravestone, doesn't it? 
but it isn't. It's in part illusion, only in part. It is, it is a head of something. This is a fossil eurypterid, a relative of the horseshoe crab from the Silurian period. The eyes are indeed eyes, but the face is not looking out at you, as it seems to all of us. In fact, you're looking down at the top of the head. The eyes, if anything, are looking up. The mouth is on the other side that you don't see. What appears to be the nose is just a bulge in the midline. The creature's bilaterally symmetrical. There are a lot of midline features. What appears to be the mouth is just the junction of the head shield with the rest of the body. Or this, and here we really get to the, I love this photo, the, the sinister one. Now this, this is again mostly illusion, but only mostly. Uh, it looks really sinister, we see that teeth and the hunched shoulders and the head coming over. Well, the teeth are teeth of an organism, but everything else is an illusion based on our tendency to see faces everywhere. In fact, what you're looking at is a photograph not at the face, as you all think, but through the backside of the skull of the howler monkey, Alawata. The teeth are indeed its teeth. Everything else is the back of the skull. You're not seeing anything else in the face. In fact, the hole on top is not a trepanation of the front of the skull, but is the foramen magnum where the spinal column is attached. That'll show you that you're at the back. What appear to be the eyes are just part of the configuration of the occiput of the skull, and what appear to be the hunched shoulders, which give it the sinister appearance, are in, in, in fact the massive lower jaw of Alouata. That's why I love that name. Alouetta is a lark, but Alouata is the howler monkey because it's, it's name. It's, I'm sure it's an onomatopoetic name. It gives forth a tremendous sound in the South American forest by the resonating, using the resonating chamber of those lower jaws, not the hunched shoulders. And then we come to issues of scale. Since we tend to see everything in our scale, if we don't know what the scale of a photo is, we do get very confused. See, we don't know what this is. Is it a photograph from 40,000 feet of a landscape? No, it isn't. In fact, it's, it's whale jaws, and we feel a, a little bit of comfort when we can identify it. Here's another, which looks like the Southwest Desert from 30 or 40,000 feet, but is again the interior of a whale jaw with some uh, blood vessel passages. And then, again, when you don't know scale, this could be, except the proportions wouldn't be quite right, a set of mountain ranges against a cloudy sky. It is not. It's the tooth of a mastodon, and these are the individual cusps. And that is the cotton that was actually in the box in which Rosamond Purcell <laughs> found the photographs. And once we know the scale, we're more comfortable. However, I do point out to you that a mastodon is a breast-toothed animal. That's Cuvier's somewhat sexist name. But the Grand Teton Mountains have exactly the same etymology, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> OK, we need to turn that off. Give me some lights back. Now, that's sort of one set of examples. I want to now give a second set. It takes me a while to warm up into the more general theme. I love little side tangents. Hope you don't mind. I, I want to warm up into the general theme of how we're always seeing not only animals but everything else in our terms by giving you four quick examples of what, in a way, is the most egregious kind of misinterpretation we can make, namely when we try to identify the attributes of animals as a result of nothing more than the arbitrary name that we happen to have given to them. So we imbue the name. It's bad enough that we back-read our, our features into organisms, but when we back-read an arbitrary name that we happen to give to an organism and then assume that its characteristics flow from this arbitrary name, then in a sense that's the ultimate of the back-reading fallacy, I think. And this pervades the ages. Uh, Steve Glickman this afternoon talked about T.H. White's bestiary translation. If you, if you look at the attributes of medieval bestiaries of where the properties of animals come from, what, why is the goat copra, for example? And it will tell us, uh, at least in, in that very same work, that it, well, they have to invert the syllables. It's, it's aspera copteth. He, he jumps in the high places, <laughs> and you reverse it, and then it's copra. But you go forward to the age of Newton and Sir Thomas Brown, who Steve also wanted to quote, but didn't have time, so I will. And we come to uh, various myths, such as the famous myth of the beaver. Now, I trust you all know the most important myth of the beaver. The myth of the beaver is that the beaver, to elude the hunter, bites off his own testicles or stones. It's a very old myth. And Sir Thomas Brown, in his Pseudodoxia Epidemica, that is his, 
his epidemic of falsity. It's the first of the great exposés of foolish wisdom, so to speak, written in the 1640s. He goes through the various reasons why people ever would have believed that <laughs> nonsense of the beaver to elude the hunter bites off his own testicles, and points out, I'm quoting now, some have been so bad grammarians as to be deceived by the name. The name for the beaver is Castor, and many people thought that was castrate, and therefore the story is likely to be true. And then Bra Brown is, is marvelous, his use of language, so if you, if you don't mind, we'll go on just a little bit. He says, after uh, pointing out that uh, the name castor has nothing to do with it, it, it does not share the same root as castration, but ultimately derives from a Sanskrit word for musk that comes later, and an incorrect interpretation of purposeful mutilation based on the internal position and therefore the near invisibility of the beaver's testicles. He then cites the factual evidence of intact males and the reasoned argument that a beaver couldn't even reach his own testicles if he wanted to bite them off. And here, this is now quoting from Brown, the testicles properly so called are of a lesser magnitude and seated inwardly upon the loins. And therefore, if it were not, it were not only a, old subjunctive tense, it were not only a fruitless attempt, mood, but impossible act to unicate or castrate themselves and might be an hazardous practice of art if at all attempted by others. <laughs> And then we move forward another hundred years to uh, Linnaeus. Linnaeus, among his many coinages, we'll come back to Mammalia later in this talk, uh, did coin as a name for the order that includes us among the mammals, primates, or first. Now that leads to all sorts of trouble, this time only in a sense in the opposite direction, because uh, this, is, this is one for the animal meaning almost taking over. In this particular case, I guess let me show the next slide. The original use, use of primate in the English language is not for monkeys and apes, I want to do this, but for heads of the Anglican Church. This is, this is Mr. Usher who gave the famous date of 4004 BC, Jacobus Asurius, the Archbishop of Armagh, Totius Iberniae Primas. I should say Harriet Ridvo's Latin pronunciation was so outstanding, I just want to assure you that I'm not being foolish, I just learned my Latin in ecclesiastical context, not because I'm a believer, I'm not. I'm a good New York Jew, but because I'm a choral singer. Totius <laughs> Iberniae <laughs> Primas, and, and primate of all Ireland. Ah, where was it? So, oh yes, I just want to read you. But, but of course, then Linnaeus used the name for monkeys and apes, and everybody thought that's the meaning. I just, I, the re this is just an excuse, because I wanted to read. One of the most marvelous letters I ever got. Somebody sent this to me. This is a letter from the Reverend Michael, Michael Ingham, who's the principal secretary to the primate of the Anglican Church of Canada. And he wrote it to a John Hearn, the director of the Wisconsin Regional Primate Research Center, who clearly, thinking that this guy represented, having seen his name in some mailing list probably, the other kind of primate. Uh, <laughs> And then it's a terrific letter. I mean, Ecclesiastics must live for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Dear Dr. Hearn, thank you for your letter of December 4th addressed to Dr. George Cram of the Primates World Relief and Development Fund, <laughs> in which you seek information for your inter international directory of primatology. I should perhaps inform you that the term primate in our context refers to the senior archbishop and chief pastor of the Anglican Church of Canada. <laughs> The Relief and Development Fund over which he presides is an agency for the alleviation of global poverty and hunger on behalf of Anglican Christians. I think the primates in your study are perhaps of a different species. <laughs> While it is true that our primate occasionally enjoys bananas, I've never, seen him <laughs> I've never seen him walk with his knuckles on the ground or scratch himself publicly under the armpits. He does have three children. But this is a far cry from, quote, breeding colonies of primates, close quote, <laughs> as your research project mentions. Like you, we do not import our primates from the wild, however. <laughs> they are elected from among the bishops of our church. This is occasionally a cause of similar, though arcane, comment. The subject of primate biology might be of great importance in your field, but alas, not so in ours. There are a mere 28 Anglican primates in the whole world. They are all males, of course. And so far, we have had no problems of reproductions. <laughs> uh, enough said. But lest you think this has all gone away, well, we can turn that off and have the lights back. I point out, to, to me, of all the wonderful scenes you can quote in Jurassic Park, 
One of the best comes right at the beginning when the paleontologist, Mr. Grand, or whatever his name is, is trying to persuade folks on his field trip out west that dinosaurs are related to birds. And he gives a whole bunch of perfectly good arguments based on anatomy, which is how the argument should be made. And then he turns around because this creature is named Velociraptor and says, even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's his, that's his closing argument. That's the, the crowning glory. Even the word raptor means bird of prey. So of course dinosaurs must be birds. This is Velociraptor. <laughs> the dinosaur, now, you know, that's a, just a wonderful example because raptor in, in English was used for humans centuries before, I think it was Linnaeus again, used it as a term for birds of prey. It comes from the Latin rapere to seize by force. And I hope you recognize that the rape of Europa next time you see Titian's, Titian's painting at the Gardner Museum in Boston refers to the abduction of, of, of Europa, not whatever happened afterwards. It's, it's the seizure by force, which is rape in the original sense. E easy to see how it acquired you know, the meaning. But it is a human word for centuries before it becomes a bird word. <laughs> well, OK, that's an introduction to the theme of this talk, which comes in two parts. Uh, first, that back reading, that is the placement of human characteristics into animals, is really, in a sense, the only way. You know, there are a few exceptions among honorable scholars, I suppose, and others. And fishermen and hunters, etc. I'm sure. But by, let's just say by far the overwhelmingly predominant way of understanding animals is by back reading human characteristics into them. And then, of course, there's this other funny fallacy that is responsible for so much of the biodeterminist nonsense. You then, having identified an animal's human phenomena and called them that, like cuckoldry or adultery or whatever, you then re-derive them as natural for humans. Because if rape exists in mallard ducks, as has been claimed, then clearly it is a biologically conditioned feature in human beings, which is nonsense on many criteria. So that'll be part one of the talk, and there's really nothing particularly original there. Part two, not only do we backread characteristics of ourselves when we're talking about animals, but Protagoras was right when he said that man is the measure of all things whether he meant just male human beings, it was using the Greek term for all of us, I leave aside for now. But that humans are the measure of all things is right, and that therefore even the most abstract and universal issues of science and philosophy are often really at root inquiries about humans, and particularly validations of human hegemony in the face of fear that we're not quite so powerful as we think we are. And this leads me at the very end to a particular argument, which in a way is the key to this talk and its only possible point of mild originality, that since human beings are a contingent product of history and not a predictable outcome of the laws of evolution or other natural laws, that therefore these abstract universals, which we have always seen as transcendently general, are really tales from historical science after all, because since they are fundamentally ways in which we justify our own status, and since our status is historically contingent rather than conditioned by laws of nature, so some of these very deepest and most abstract issues are really talks about historical particulars and not the transcending generalities they have always been assumed to be. Let me then go to the first point, back reading, as the only way we have looked at or tried to understand animals. First, let me point out that there is limited legitimacy to this on occasion, because there is genuine homology. That is, we are animals, and we are evolved from other animals, and we do have varying degrees of kinship with animals. And as you know, evolutionary biologists make this key distinction when judging similarities that exist among different organisms into homology and analogy. Analogy is similarities held because evolution is produced independently pretty much the same form over and over again. The wing of a bat, the wing of a bird, the wing of an insect, the wing of a pterosaur. These are analogous features because the common ancestor of no pair had wings, so the wing is evolved separately in each lineage. Homology are traits shared by common descent. The bones in the arm of the whale and the horse and the bat and me are effectively the same topologically. The whale swims, the bat flies, the horse runs and I gesticulate. Clearly, this is not a result of 
separate evolution for common function, but is a tie to history. We all have the same bones because we're com we have common ancestor in mammals, which have this configuration. And the point is, for evolutionary biologists, homology has primacy. Homological similarity, the similarity of history and descent, is overwhelmingly powerful because uh, an analogous similarity, a convergence as we call it, can never be anything other than superficial. You cannot get independent evolution of hundreds of similar features. It's just a mathematical probability argument. If you have complex similarity, it's homologous. And so homology is a deep and fundamental and important. Let me just give you one example of an excellent argument from homology. In other words, a legitimate back reading or forward reading in this case. Oh, and I, I forgot, the obvious point is that since we know ourselves best, if you can make an, a genuine argument from homology, it may not be invalid to see a feature in us that we understand better because we know it from personal experience and use that to interpret animal features if they are truly homologous. It's not invalid. Let, let me give you my absolute favorite example of a brilliant argument by homology, in this case more to explain humans from animal models. And that's the third of Darwin's evolutionary book. I mean, all his books were evolutionary in one sense, but I like to see his great evolutionary books as a trilogy, The Origin of Species, 1859, The Descent of Man, 1871, and the one that deserves to be much more read, the third member of the trilogy, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, in 1872, an absolutely brilliant book. Brilliant in the first sense because he does what he always does. Uh, one of the things that this sophisticated audience wouldn't misunderstand, but it's so often misunderstood about intellectual life, is, uh, which is responsible for a lot of the talking heads fallacies on television. The intellectual is supposed to be the people who have the deepest knowledge about the broadest questions. Put on an intellectual and he'll tell you what the course of the future is going to be. No, that's not right. The Often the most important thing is to recognize the limits of what, and to stick to what can be done. The brilliance of Darwin's book about the emotions is that he's not trying to interpret in evolutionary terms what can't be done, namely the deep meaning of the emotions, the moral value of the emotions. He's talking about the expression of the emotions in man and animals, that is the physical appearance, the gestural capacities. And there he, the whole book is one really brilliant argument, namely, that if you look at the universal form of those emotional expressions that are universal across human cultures, and Darwin was at great pains to try to establish that universality, and you interpret them by seeing their homological similarity with expressions in other mammals, then you can understand that their origin must be evolutionary and cannot be by divine creation because although the expressions have no functional meaning in humans. They seem arbitrary. They don't have to mean what they universally do. When you see what the other animals are doing in whom this emotion first arose, it's very functional there. And therefore, the homology is vestigially, not vestigial, we use it for something else. It is retained in human expression, though the original purpose is no longer valid. That sounds complex. I can show you by example. It's much better. Three examples. Oh, homology. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, we see it. That's the whole point. A few more pictures from Rosamund Purcell, the cat whose skull is ours, and we know it. I need more lights. Up. The feet of a bog person and the hands of a monkey. Clearly, we see the homology, and we are not deceived. All right, from Darwin now, terror. What do we do? We draw back. We open our eyes as wide as possible and our mouth as wide as possible. <gasps> terror and surprise. What's that all about? We draw in. I mean, Darwin's argument is, and it's brilliant, and I think he's probably right, is that when faced with terror and great danger, what we have to do is take in as much information as we possibly can. So we draw back against the act. We open our eyes to see. We <gasps> take in so that we can smell or taste so that we have maximal information. That is not functional for most causes of terror in human society today, but that's where it comes from. Or disgust, which is the vomiting reaction. Bleh. <laughs> By the way, this book is popular among collectors because it represents one of the very first uses of photography in scientific arguments. And my favorite of all examples, and I'm sure he's right, Rage, what do we do? We snarl, we go, 
Now, what do we do? We raise the side, you know, do the action. If you never realize it, you'll notice that you do it. You raise the side of your lips, thereby exposing your canine teeth, which are no bigger in humans than any other teeth, and therefore are not a threat at all. <laughs> but in other animals, the raising of the lips and the exposure of the canines shows the large, dangerous teeth, as in the dog. And therefore, it makes sense there, but we still do it, and it must be homological retention. Now, the point is, I, I'm, what, how are we doing for time? Actually, doing pretty well for time. Um, I've got to take five minutes for straight science. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if this seems arcane, but I, I don't want to leave the subject of homology without saying something about the most exciting development in development as the science of embryological growth and evolutionary theory in the last decade, namely the beginnings of understandings through genetic tracings of the actual course of development as genetically mediated. What we have found is that the extent of homology is just vastly greater than anyone would have thought. In 1963, Ernst Meyer, the greatest evolutionist of this generation, Ernst is still around, he's 90 years old, he'd be the first to say that was a dumb thing I wrote in 63 and would revel in the contrary finding. But expressing the Darwinian consensus of the 60s, Meyer said it would be vain to look for any homology, that is genetic identity, similarity based on common ancestry in the genetic sequences of genes from different phyla, such as insects and humans, to choose the obvious example, that have been separate for at least 550 million years. Because we know that natural selection is so powerful and has so completely altered every aspect of the genome that whatever similarities might have once existed have clearly been wiped out by the independent evolution over all that time and in such different directions. Friends, it is not so. The uh, homologies between distant phyla are quite stunning and often produce very similar features. Uh, many people have been saying it's the paper of the decade, and I think that's probably right. But if any of you saw the cover of Science a couple of weeks ago, these remarkable experiments showing that a single gene, Eyeless and Drosophila, can, when expressed in a part of the body that doesn't normally form eyes, produce fully functional eyes. You can make them on the wing, you can make them on the tips of the antennae, you can make them on the legs, you can make them practically anywhere. Point being that the homologue of that gene in humans, called aniridia, and in mice, works ex just as well on the insects <laughs> to produce eyes. The development of eyes in insects, in humans, and in squid is the classic textbook example of convergence, that is, of independent evolution. And clearly, in an anatomical sense, that is correct. But it turns out there is homological underpinning of the developmental pathway. They all carry the same Pax6 gene that makes the structures, or the sets up the making there. That's stunning. I, I mean, I root for things like that for, for reasons I don't have time to go into. It very much expresses my view of life. So I'm predisposed to accept these things. I, I never would have dreamed. I'd have bet a substantial amount of money even two weeks ago that you could never get a result like that in flies. Let me give you the example that's been most in the press. I'll go through this fast, and I'm sorry if it goes by too quickly for some. I wish I had more time. This is about body segmentation and the famous homeobox stories in uh, arthropods, that is the group that includes insects and vertebrates. It's, not a, it's an old argument. This is from Etienne Geoffroy saint -Hilaire in 1830, who made an argument, which turned out to be wrong in detail, but for which he was ridiculed, that insects and vertebrates have a common structure based on the archetype of the vertebra, just as Goethe, his friend, had argued that the common form of plant structures is the leaf, the or pflanze. And so here, in an 1830 publication, Geoffroy has drawn a segment of a lobster, but made it look like an element of the spinal column and a pair of ribs because he believed that that was a true homology. And he did not shy away from the implications of that, which are, let's face it, that if this be so, then an insect who has an external skeleton lives within its own vertebrae, lives inside its vertebrae, and walks on its ribs. Now, that comparison is wrong. And because it's wrong, people just threw aside that notion that there could be similarity in a genetic homological sense and segmentation until all the discoveries based initially on the so-called homeotic mutants of Drosophila very quickly. 
The ordinary antenna of Drosophila, the fruit fly, consists of two parts, the antenna and the so-called arista at the end. There are a set of odd mutations which have been known for a long time called the home. Let this flow over you. Don't, if you don't try to get every little detail and you're not, there's going to be no quiz on it afterwards, you'll probably get it as I go through it because it's a beautifully simple story in one sense and there's only a couple key points we're after. There's this remarkable class of mutations called homeotic mutations which place a body structure in an utterly wrong part, so to speak. This is antennapedia, in which a leg appears where an antenna ought to be. That's not as weird as it sounds, because evolutionarily, legs and antennae are based on the same initial structures. Now, about 20 years ago, Ed Lewis at Caltech made a brilliant and confirmed genetic model that explained how these homeotic mutations work. This is an ordinary insect as it develops. The larva is on the left, the adult fly on the right. It's a series of segments, H at top is head. T1, T2, and T3 are the three segments of the thorax. That's all we have to be concerned with. In insects, each thoracic segment bears a leg. That's why insects have six legs, because there are three thoracic segments, and each bears a leg. The second thoracic segment bears a pair of wings, most insects have two pairs of wings, and the third thoracic segment also bears wings. In flies, which have only two wings, unlike most insects, the third thoracic segment bears a vestigial set of wings called halteres, shown in the next slide. And then you get a bunch of abdominal segments behind. All right, what Ed Lewis figured out is that there's a wonderfully simple model for how the differentiation proceeds in the right order. That is, there are a series of genes Drosophila has only four chromosomes. These genes are on one arm of the third chromosome, and they're lined up in a row. They're products of a single ancestral gene that duplicated and put its duplicate copies right next to each other along a line. What happens is the following. The genes that produce the correct ordering of the segments and differentiating of the segments turn on in sequence. The first gene turns on, that's number zero along the bottom line, turns on in the second thoracic segment, orange is where it's working, and then is expressed all the way back, T2, T3, all the abdominal segments, A1 to A. The second gene turns on further back, see it, it turns on in A1, and then is expressed all the way further back. The third gene, number two, starts in A2 and is expressed all the way back. The whole point of this, the only thing you have to grasp, is that this produces a gradient where the maximum gene product is at the back of the organism, because all the genes are expressed in A8. You see they're all orange. And a minimum amount of the gene product is up front there. T1 has none, T2 has a half. What that means, that's the signal. You differentiate according to how much of the gene product you have. Simple prediction, which is the, the affirmation of which broke the dike in understanding this. Simple prediction. Mutations that intensify the gradient that give you more gene product than you ought to have, make posterior structures, the ones in the back at the bottom, move forward. Because you're getting more gene product, and so that happens. Most mutations are so-called deletion, or loss of function mutations. You get less of the gradient. What that means is that structures that ought to be up front appear further back. Because there's less gene product further back than there ought to be. And less gene product means you're differentiating as though you're up in front of the body. Now that simple theme explains all the really weird homeotic mutations at the back end of Drosophila. The most famous of all is Bithorax, which is the four-winged Drosophila. It's as though it recovered its evolutionary past and has four wings again. But it isn't. It's just a loss of function mutation in which, because there's less gene product, the third thoracic segment, which ought to develop these vestigial halteres, there isn't enough gene product there, so it thinks it ought to be a second, it, it thinks it ought to be another second thoracic segment, because less gene product. And so it just grows its third as though it were another second. So you have two seconds, and since seconds grow wings, you have a four-winged fly. It's not really recreating its ancestry. And then an even weirder one called bithoraxoid, the eight-legged fly. Insects have six legs. Here's one that seems to violate the definition of its class, but it's the same thing. It's a loss of function mutation. There isn't enough gene product in the first abdominal, um, abdominal segment. Therefore, it thinks, you see, uh, we, we use back reading of intent language all the time, but 
that segment thinks it ought to differentiate as, as a supernumerary thoracic segment, and so it does. Instead of being a first abdominal, it differentiates as another third thoracic. The third thoracic has legs, so now we have eight legs instead of six. Well, okay, so far it's just an insect story. Here's the great discovery of the last 10 years. The same genes exist in vertebrates. In fact, they exist in fourfold repetition. There's the whole sequence exists four times in vertebrates. They were mapped by tracing these so-called homeoboxes. So if you know that word, homeobox, that's where, because not the homeoboxes build the stuff. The homeobox is a common element that allows you to identify and map these genes. That's probably why we don't have weird homeotic mutations in vertebrates, because there are four copies of all these genes. So if one of them mutates, the other three is still presumably expressing the normal state and can overwhelm it, whereas an insect is only one copy. So if it mutates, it expresses. Uh, but it's not stunning. I mean, Geoffroy was right after all. There is a fourfold repetition of clearly homologous, 90 to 95% similar after 550 million years of separation from the insect case. And you might say, yeah, but, but so what? If it's not doing anything, it's making segments or it's differentiating segments in insects, what, what's it doing in invertebrates? If it's doing something totally different, then so what? Well, it isn't. That's the fascinating thing. Turns out, look, in vertebrate backbone segments are not the same thing as insect body segments. That's where Geoffroy was wrong. But what people had forgotten is something that all the great 19th century embryologists knew. And that is that the brain, the mid and hind brain, as it differentiates in embryology, develops as a set of segments. And uh, people just forgotten that bit of descriptive anatomy. Now you might say, well, but it's all erased in the adult brain. Um, they're called rhombomeres, by the way, these segments, but, but it's not because the tongue structures, the uh, cranial nerve divisions are largely reflective of this old segmentation. And what you see here is the Drosophila sequence, the fruit fly sequence at the top, the mouse sequence, one of the four mouse sequence, Hox2, and at the bottom, the R1 through R8 are the rhombomeres, that is the segments of the developing brain, and you can see Four of the Hox genes, that is the mammalian homolog of the invertebrate genes, and they are expressing not in the spinal column, but in the rhombomeres. So clearly they're determining the rhombomeres, which are the homo homologs of the insect segments, which is fascinating. And this is a, a, a mouse embryo showing that most of these genes, you can see them along the top, are expressing in the rhombomeres. And here are the rhombomeres themselves. The initial vertebrates, by the way, had very small backbones. That is the part that isn't homologous. And very large uh, gill baskets, which are the homologs, which do come out of the rhombomeres. So the initial vertebrates in the fossil record are mostly expressing the system of segmentation that is the homolog of the insect case. It's just a fantastic story. Couldn't not say it. One last point about homology, and we'll just look at the next slide. This is one of the most poignant pictures I was ever set. This is the gravestone of Baby Faye. You may remember her story at Loma Linda University. Uh, Baboon's heart was engrafted into her, and she died. Uh, I, this is something so touching, call it vernacular art, but the two hearts on her tombstone, her own that failed, and the baboon heart that failed, or is it her mother and father who loved her? I don't know. But the point is, I don't want to make a big point, and I don't know whether she could have been saved under any circumstances, but it was, I don't want to be too strong because it might be suable for all I know in this society. Let us just say it was foolish in the extreme and not understanding of evolutionary principles. If the experiment was to be done at all to use a baboon heart and not a chimpanzee heart, baboons are 30 million years evolutionarily distant from humans, immunological acceptance or rejection is a question of overall genetic similarity, which is homology. Chimpanzees are six to eight million years different. If you look at Dr. Bailey's justification for why he did, he said, well, it was all functional, given in functional terms. Well, a baboon heart's about the right size. Chimpanzee hearts are hard to get. But then we come to the key point. Dr. Bailey is a Seventh-day Adventist. He doesn't believe in evolution. Sometimes if you don't get what it's all about, you can make some tragic Errors, I will leave it at that. Uh, okay, let's have the lights. Mm -hmm. uh, fallacies. 
However, though, though homology is a legitimate theme indeed, there are many fallacies based on false usages and takings of evolution. The one I've written about most of my own career is gradualism, progressionism, continuity theories. Not everything is homology. Chimp language debate, we'll hear some, and I don't want to insert myself in something I don't know a great deal about, but I think everyone would agree that many errors were made in assuming that there could be a kind of strict continuity between basically gestural systems of organisms that are close to our ancestry and this language faculty, which is uniquely human. Many people even misread Chomsky as a quasi-creationist because he says there is no continuity. He doesn't mean that God put it in there. It means that what we call the language organ may have been co-opted from some other mental function. And certainly, that it is, evolution does not mean adaptive gradualistic continuity. That is one of its modes. And then we have other fallacies, of which, of course, the main one is the supremacist or the progressionist fallacy, the paradox of seeing animals as both lesser than us, but also defined by us, or even by our arbitrary words, in the examples I gave. Oh, I can't, apropos really of nothing, uh, I, I just one comment in the introduction this morning, Sir Edmund Leach, who I also knew as a crusty character, was mentioned on the subject of animal curses. My colleague Jack Bay told me something really interesting the other day, a great 18th century linguistic scholar of Johnson and others. Apparently the phrase son of a bitch, one of our curse words today, began as a euphemism. I never knew that. Because the one thing you couldn't call anyone in the 18th century who really risked a duel literally was a dog. You are a dog, sir. <laughs> that was cause for fighting. Son of a bitch. That was sufficiently euphemistic. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. I, apropos of absolutely nothing <laughs> with respect to you. Had to share that with you. Now, what I want to show in the next part, I started very late, right? So I can go for a while. What I want to show in the next part is that uh, this fallacy, this paradox, if you will, that they are lesser than us but defined by us through the supremacist or progressionist reading, goes through all ideologies. It's a constant. You would have thought maybe that evolution would have made it better, would have shown a kinship and a partnership. And the argument could be used that way, but historically that has not been its primary weight. The notion of back reading of lesser than but defined by goes right through. Evolution is not the watershed that one might be led to assume it ought to have been by Freud's famous observation that all great revolutions in the history of science kick human arrogance off one pedestal after another of our claims for cosmic self-importance. First, the Copernican revolution that made our place in the universe peripheral, then the Darwinian revolution that relegated us to descend from an animal world, quoting Freud, and then in what I like to call the least modest statement of intellectual history, his own that taught us we didn't have rational minds by discovering the unconscious. Uh, but it doesn't work. You see, we can spin doctor the story. That is, we can accept the Darwinian revolution and descent relegation to descend from an animal world, but we spin doctor it. The, the revolution is not complete in Freud's very prescient sense until we accept the pedestal smashing consequences. And that's what we're not willing to do. I'll come back to that. At the end. We are not willing to do that. We want to still read animals in our terms as lesser, lesser than, and although defined by. We want to see ourselves at the top of the heap. We want to see evolution as predictably progressive, complexifying, and sensibly leading towards us in a predictable manner. And then we can spin Dr. the Darwinian revolution to avoid the Freudian implications. And uh, so let me just very quickly talk about two pre-evolutionary versions. I call them pinnacle theories and embodiment theories, both, both of which point to the same direction. First, pinnacle theories, in which we see ourselves at the top of a progressive sequence. You don't need evolutionary theory for that. Progressive sequence can be the creative chain of being. The next slide. Uh, Charles White, Regular Gradation in Man, 1799, was mentioned by a previous speaker. This is his main chart in which you see this motley collection of a so-called progressive sequence from birds at the lower left to dogs to primates, and then up the conventional racist ladder of human groups from African blacks to American Indians to Greek statuary on the right. So this also clearly has social implications. And then we have embodiment theories, the notion that 
not so much that we're at the pinnacle, but all the lower creatures are imperfect embodiments of us. Now, the most wonderful example of that, oh, ex many examples, occur among the, uh, the German Naturphilosophen of the early 19th century. I did a study of Lorenz Aachen in my book Ontogeny and Phylogeny. He published his Lehrbuch der Naturphilosophie between 1809 and 1811. And his theory has this marvelous notion with full of, the, the whole book, this very thick book, the Lehrbuch, is nothing but a series of 4,000 oracular pronouncements. And the basic notion is that all development begins with a primal zero and progresses to complexity by the successive addition of organs in a determined sequence. The sequence of additions follows Aachen's ordering of the four Greek elements, earth processes or nutritive organs first, water processes or digestion second, air processes, respiration third, and ether or fire processes, motion fourth. Man, his word, contain all the organs within himself, thus he represents the entire world, because all, all the organs are in humans. Uh, quoting now, in the profoundest, truest sense, a microcosm. Man is the summit. The crown of nature's development must comprehend everything that has preceded him. In a word, man must represent the whole world in miniature. Not quoting anymore. All lower animals, as imperfect or incomplete humans, contain fewer than the total set of organs. Quoting again, the animal kingdom, this is the most famous pronouncement in the Lehrbuch, the animal kingdom is only a dismemberment of the highest animal, that is, of man. And then, just as White uses the racial implications, let me read you the closing oracular pronouncements. Now, poor Aachen was just a romantic liberal, but you can see how notions like this can be used for other uh, German social philosophies that came after him. He talks about the sequential ordering of human skills. The first science is the science of language, the architecture of science, the earth, remember the Greek. I'm not saying any of this makes sense. I'm just quoting. The second science is the art of rhetoric, the sculpture of science, the river, in other words, water. Remember the sequence, earth, water, air, fire. The third science is philosophy, the painting of science, the breath, air. The fourth science is the art of war, Kriegskunst, the art of motion, dance, music, the poetry of science, the light, fire. As all arts are united in poetry, so are all arts and sciences united in the art of war. The art of war is the highest, the most exalted, the most godly, göttliche art. The hero, the held, is the highest man. The hero is the god of mankind. Through the hero is mankind free. The hero is the prince. The hero is God. That's how the book ends. And then, of course, we have the myth of meliorism, namely that, uh, we can turn that off again. Namely, that once you get the evolutionary reading, or you get towards it, things ought to be better, right? Because <laughs> now we're getting closer to a truthful biological theory. So let's come to Linnaeus, who's not yet an evolutionist, but at least is trying to place humans into nature. This is the 12th and last edition of the Sistema Naturae of 1766. And it's really quite wonderful, because he's on that crux. He is including humans. I'll get to the origin of mammalia in just a moment. But you read his uh, definitions of the order primates, which includes four genera, homo for us, simia for monkeys, le lemur for the prosendians, eye eyes, etc. And he includes bats, so vespertilio, the bats. And when you read his Latin descriptions, he gives the standard differentia, as was explained, I think, by Juliet Clotten Brock. So for vespertilio, he writes manus palmato volatiles. Uh, hands are, are palmate and are flying wings. For lemur, dentes primores inferiores sex. Uh, the lower teeth, there's have six lower incisors of teeth. He writes only one thing. Homo, nosce te ipsum. Know thyself. <laughs> Quite beautiful. So we are within my mic died. I said, okay, my me, because I think, oh, it lives again. Let me, uh, one other thing about L Linnaeus, this wonderful story of the coining of the term mammal. This is not my argument. This comes from Londa Schiebinger, wrote an article and a book on it, which impressed me greatly. You see, I knew before I read her work that Linnaeus had invented the term mammalia for our vertebrate class in the System Naturae of 1758, but I thought that he'd simply promoted an old vernacular word to a new technical meaning. However, what Londa showed is that Linnaeus truly invented the word, that no language had ever before referred to the group of warm-blooded, 
hair sporting live bearing vertebrates as mammals. All previous systems had treated and named our relatives differently. Aristotle had established a vertebrate group called Quadrupedia with a primary subdivision, not four legs, with a primary subdivision into oviparia, scaly and egg laying, including reptiles and some amphibians, and viviparia, that is hairy and live bearing, thus including most mammals, but please remember excluding such creatures as bats, whales, and most importantly, humans who could remain separate. By Linnaeus's time, our group had a better definition, but no recognized name. John Ray, for example, the Englishman, the greatest of Linnaeus's predecessors, had suggested pylosa, meaning hairy, as a way of annexing obviously related animals that did not exhibit Aristotle's defining feature of four legs. So why did Linnaeus choose a new name? And why particularly did he choose such a peculiar term as mammalia, referring obviously to the female breast? We must grasp the extreme unconventionality of Linnaeus's decision. Most generally, and for the usual sexist reasons, we tend to personify active phenomena as male. And organisms judged most complex should ordinarily fall under this sad convention. Now, by the way, in contemporary English, we still invariably refer to an unsexed animal as he, right? As in, isn't he cute? Or, look at him go. If Linnaeus had been an explicit egalitarian, out to sink a bad habit by example, he might have chosen mammalia for this overt political reason, but Linnaeus was a social conservative and a conventional sexist. More, more particularly, zoologists have long translated this general cultural convention into technical practice. Do you realize that in taxonomies, it is still stated that the so-called type specimen, that is the defining name bearer for species, has to be male? That is still a rule of, of biological naming. Why then did Linnaeus choose a female trait to define the highest group, apparently adding insult to male injury by selecting a feature that males also possess, but in a rudimentary and useless state? Now, Schiebinger argues cogently that Linnaeus made this decision for an ideological reason, one very distant from any notion of sexual equality. Linnaeus had been deeply engaged in a different and equally important battle this time, or so most of us would judge today, on the right side, namely his campaign to classify humans into nature. This is Amelia's part of it. To classify humans into nature with other animals at a time when many naturalists still insist on a separate human kingdom for beings with a soul and created in God's image. Our propagandists have always recognized that an adroit choice of name can convey great power of persuasion. Nature's almost invariably been personified as female. It's a cultural linguistic tradition that dates at least to Chaucer. If one wishes to gain some rhetorical advantage in a struggle to place humans within nature, then choose a female feature to define our larger group, thereby emphasizing our closeness to Mother Earth and her other animate productions. Interestingly, in the same work that defined our larger group as within nature, Linnaeus sought to separate us as a species for our mental prowess, and here he chose a male designation, Homo sapiens, although the Latin Homo, I realize, may be taken more generally in the old sense of humankind, while vir is more specifically a male person, from which we obtain, by the way, and for sexist reasons, the notions of virtue, although it's feminine in most European languages, of virtue and virility. Where was I? All right, so Linnaeus is meliorist. Darwin is the next step in melioration. We finally get evolutionary theory. But it doesn't work. And it doesn't work in the small, and it doesn't work in the grand. I want to give two examples, and I'll move on to the second part of the talk, which is meant to be much shorter, not only by, by overstaying my welcome here. And, um, A small example of the errors we still make, just in a particular case, and then a large one in how we look at the whole history of life, so we can get the slides back. This is a study done by a colleague of mine in the sociobiological research tradition. I, it's not what I want to criticize about it right here. I want to criticize the back reading of characteristics. Let me just tell you what he did. This is meant to be a study of the adaptive meaning of a behavior in eastern bluebirds. Uh, pardon me, I think it's western bluebird in any event. No, sorry, I, I, it wasn't meant to be a joke. I should have this accurately, and then I'll tell you. In mountain bluebirds, which are a western species. 
Here's what he did. He took two nests, and the females tend to sit at the nest. The males go out foraging for food. While the males were out foraging, he took a stuffed male and placed it by the nest and saw what the returning male who belonged in the nest, so to speak, would do. Would the male be aggressive to this presumed potential imposter, and would he be aggressive to the female? Now, on the vertical axis of the number of aggressive encounters towards the male stuffed bird, the model, and the female. Now, he did this at, I've got to show you. He did this at various times. Here's where the nest has begun. He did it for the first time, that is, exposed the stuffed bird, after the nest was begun, but before any eggs had been laid, before the nest was even completed. And there were a lot of aggressive encounters. Two nests, the black dots at the top of the number of aggressive encounters towards the stuffed bird, the intruding male. The white circles show aggressive encounters towards the female. In fact, in one case, the female was thrown out of the nest. Then after the eggs were laid, you see, he did it again. And he found many, pardon me, fewer aggressive approaches towards the stuffed bird, the imposter, and uh, none towards the female. And then he did it one last time after hatching of the eggs and found even fewer aggressive encounters towards the supposed intruder. I want to read you his interpretation of this. This is such a wonderful example of how we read human traits of human language and then re-derive them. The results are consistent with the expectations of evolutionary theory. Thus, aggression toward an intruding male, the model, would clearly be especially advantageous early in the breeding season when territories and nests are normally defended. The initial aggressive response to the mated female is also adaptive in that, given a situation suggesting a high probability of adultery, the human word, that is, he defines it in this context, the presence of the model near the female, and assuming that replacement females are available, obtaining a new mate would enhance the fitness of males. You see the point. If you're going to help this female raise someone else's genes, you don't want to do that. So, However, after the eggs are laid, it doesn't matter because you know your genes are in there if you've been watching carefully before. So he goes on. The decline in male... Look, this could be right. It's just the language I'm talking about. The decline in male-female aggressiveness during incubation and fledgling stages could be attributed to the impossibility of being cuckolded. That was now wonderful, because that's a word that, of course, comes from animals, cuckoos, <laughs> but is then used in a human sense, and now it's being reimposed on other birds. <laughs> the impossibility of being cuckolded after the eggs have been laid. I mean, it's a particularly wonderful example, because it is so obviously subject to a different interpretation, I simply point out to you. Namely, the... Uh, model, that is the stuffed bird, is exposed. The male comes back, pecks at the stuffed bird, gets mad at the female too. Then a few days later, the same stuffed bird and the same male. So he comes back, pecks at the stuffed bird a few times, and says, it's that goddamn stuffed bird again. <laughs> I'm back reading too, you see. <laughs> and doesn't bother the female. It doesn't have to have anything to do with genetic adaptive behaviors. Oh, well. Now the example in the large. We are going to have to race through these, but we'll do it. Uh, second half short, second half short. Uh, the whole history of life we view as a grand back reading. We see the whole history of life as predictably preparatory. We see all previous creatures as precursors or avatars of the eventual appearance of humans. Now I've kind of almost made a speaking profession of showing iconographies of this particular pervasive bias. I usually show ladder of progress humorous scenes. I'll show you just uh, four or five, because I, I want something else I want to show you, which is even more profoundly illustrative of the bias. Uh, <laughs> this is surf trunks through history, the California version. <laughs> yeah, Clearly, this is a parody, but it's a parody that everybody understands because that's how we tend to see evolution. It's predictably progressive, not so determined. The next one, we're all New Yorkers here, right? It's the New Yorker version. <laughs> Don't think it's distinctively American. I bought this in the Bazaar of Agra in India years ago. This is the British version. 
This is a Pepsi ad, as those of you who can read the language will recognize. Uh, while we're talking about iconographic bias, this is an Israeli one, obviously. It's the only sequence I ever saw that goes right to left. <laughs> And then this is why this is education in the Bush Reagan years, but um, but this one is particularly wonderful because it's just four monkeys with dunce caps, right? And unless you know what it's a parody of, it doesn't make any sense. But everybody gets it immediately. All right, that's not what I want to show the so-called high culture version, if you will, <laughs> namely the attempts in museum murals and coffee table books to paint the history of life. This is a genre that has been with us only since the mid-19th century, because it was only then that we had a geological time scale and we could actually do a sequential series of paintings. I want to first show you the two major iconographies of life's history in the 20th century, and then I'll show you something about the origin of this tendency and show you how pervasive this reading of the whole history of animals as avatars and precursors, lesser than on the way to, pervades that standard interpretation. The first is a series from uh, uh, National Geographic 1942 by Charles R. Knight, the great artist who owned this genre from the 20s until he died in the 50s. He did all the great mural paintings in American museums, go up and see the restored mammal hall at the Museum of Natural History, go to Chicago in the Field Museum, go to the Tar Pits Museum in Los Angeles. First bias, the multicellular history of animal life is about half the history of invertebrates. But you almost, you get very few pictures of invertebrates. Here's one of the Burgess Shale. Here's the only other one he has of these large Eurypterids, horseshoe crab relatives, as in that first slide I showed. Uh, and then you never see another invertebrate again, never. We've got 20 or 30 other pictures, they're all vertebrates. There are no invertebrates in there. Look, invertebrates didn't go away. They didn't stop evolving but you never see them again. This is supposed to be the parade of life through the ages. It's not supposed to be the path to man, which would be parochially bad enough in the old gender bias language. It's supposed to be a representation of life's history. It isn't. We have never depicted life's history in this high culture genre as anything other than a parochial sequence of those forms we thought were most advanced at their moments and leading towards us. That's all we've ever done. It's so egregiously biased and we never think about it. I've seen these all my life. I never cottoned on to this till last year. Then fit, as soon as fishes evolve, you never see another invertebrate. As soon as one lineage of fishes gets out on land, you never see another fish. Does that make sense? 60% of vertebrate species are fishes. 90% of fishes are teleos, higher bony fishes. Teleos did not evolve until the Cretaceous, or did not spread until the Cretaceous, which is the dinosaur period. Therefore, since dinosaurs had already evolved, you never see a teleos fish. In other words, the process that produced more than half of all the species of vertebrates is wiped out of the record of life by this iconography. Is that the history of life? Ah, an exception? No. You are allowed to show a marine scene once the dinosaurs evolved, but you can't put any fishes there. It's not a fish. It's a mosasaur, a marine lizard. You can show members of a high group that have returned to an old environment, but you can't show the permanent inhabitants thereof. Then mammals, then humans. And then we get the second great sequence. These, and this is interesting. This is the, the series of coffee table books done by Augusta and Burian, Czech team in the 1950s. You read the text, it's Marxist claptrap. Couldn't be more different from the quasi-Christian rationalizations of Charles R. Knight. But the se sequence of pictures is exactly the same. This is their Cambrian scene, their Ordovician scene, their Silurian scene. We have three invertebrates. But then it's the same story. Never an invertebrate after fishes evolve. Never a fish after vertebrates evolve on land. A marine scene, yes, but no fish, only the seagoing lizards and the pterosaurs. Teeny little fish that one of the pterosaurs has caught, but not as an actor unto itself, and then mammals. There has never been any deviation. If you look in the first great representation of this genre, which Martin Rudwick has shown, is the work of Louis Figuier, the great French populist of the mid-19th century, you see exactly the same sequence. These are lithographs by uh, Edouard Rioux, who is also Jules Verne lithographer. So first we have the Cambrian scene. By the way, another wonderful old convention that you show animals in the water thrown up and desiccating on land. That is the standard depiction up until the aquarium craze of the 1840s and 1850s. Interesting. Another example of iconographic bias that I got to write about sometime. 
more invertebrates thrown up on the land. Now, here is the aquarium view, but that's from a later edition. That was interpolated later after the aquarium, aquarium craze had made that mode of viewing canonical. And then same, same sequence, vertebrates on land, dinosaurs fighting, older representation. Marine scenes show only reptiles thereafter. Mammals, humans in this Edenic scene. Where does it all come from? It, it doesn't just come from studies of the history of life, so we didn't have the data until 1850. Martin Rudwick makes the excellent argument that if you're going to look for iconographic precursors for this, it's off again. Not that I mind, I can shout, but it's off. Oh. <laughs> uh, that a lot of it comes from the history of biblical illustration. The key work here is this magnificent four-volume text of Scheuze, the great Swiss savant of the early 18th century called Physica Sacra, in which he... Uh, Basically, in 750 full-page plates in five volumes done by a team of 18 engravers, it's the cosmos of his day. So you have to see it that way. It's that kind of project. Uh, shows everything in the Bible that has natural history implications. And it's the same iconography. So it's the opus. You see the title on the bottom left, the opus primi diei, the work of the first day, chaos, wonderful Baroque frames were done by one, one engraver who did just the frames of the 750 diagrams. And then the creation of invertebrate life on the fifth day, opus quinte die, thrown up on the land following that convention. And then the creation of insects later that day. In sequence, the creation of fishes. You see it goes up the standard sequence. The creation of birds. The creation of beasts. The creation of humans with a wonderful Latin pun, homo ex humo man from the earth, and serpent seductor, the serpent tempts Eve and Adam in the garden, and ficus folium, the ditatus tegmen, they take a fig leaf to cover their nudity. Around the border, we have the taxonomy of the genus ficus, the figs, for the scientific content. And oh, that's it. We turn that off. So, so much for that. Second part of the talk, very, no more than 15 minutes guaranteed, probably less. We, as uh, Protagoras said, are so much the measure of all things, so that even the most abstract and universal issues of science and philosophy are often backread from desires to assert our primacy, so that many of the great timeless abstractions really arise from the contingent history of us. There is this uh, dichotomy I talk about in the sciences, as popularly understood. I don't mean it's this simple in more decent analyses, uh, whereas there's one kind of science which represents the stereotype we all learned. Science is experimental, predictive, quantitative. You bring and simplify into the internal laboratory. You make predictive statements. You find out the laws of nature. This is good or hard science. And uh, then, however, there are those sciences which are in a sense, relegated to explaining those uniquenesses that can occur but once in all the detailed glory of history, much of cosmology, evolution, geology, paleontology. And these are the lesser or the soft sciences. There's a hierarchy that goes from adamantine physics at top to squishy subjects like psychology. At the bottom, I feel some affinity there because paleontology is pretty squishy too. <laughs> at Harvard, we actually set up our science curriculum in the general education program, the core curriculum, in a somewhat innovatory way. That is, we didn't just make the standard division into natural and physical sciences or physical and social sciences. We actually recognized these two styles of the ahistorical predictive and the historical explanatory. But we called them A and B, and guess which one was A? <laughs> well, as a member and proud of it, of one of the B sciences, the paleontology, I've uh, tried to institute, that's not original with me, something of a campaign to get people to recognize the virtues, the excitements, the power, the equal explanatory role of the sciences of contingency, that is the sciences that are not trying to explain things by subsumption and prediction from nature's laws, but by the actual nature of the antecedent states that happened to occur, but could have unfolded in a totally different sequence, which would have led to an entirely different outcome. Very different mode of explanation, but when you have enough evidence about antecedent states, just as powerful, just as good. 
point I want to make, and this is a quick summary of the arguments in my book, Wonderful Life, is that humans, though we have tried to see our origin under the predictive models of the A sciences, hence all this iconography, as something that was, if not bound to occur in exactly this form, was at least expectable and understandable under nature's laws of evolution as complexification, that it is not that at all that we are products of a contingent history, makes sense, is explainable, but rewind the tape of life to the early history of multicellular forms, and you get a whole different set of solutions every time, most of which equally explainable, equally powerful, do not include the origin of any self-conscious creature to have come from things like this. Now, the interesting point is, this will be the last sequence of slides, is that we are quite comfortable with contingentist explanations for human history. We know they apply. This is the angle of Gettysburg, towards which Robert E. Lee directed towards those trees his men in Pickett's Charge. This is the cycloramic painting of Pickett's Charge of Gettysburg. Now, in a sense, the power of Gettysburg for us is that we know the war could have gone the other way. It was not foreordained by the strength of human, Union armies that our side up here was going to win. July 4th, 1863 was a very crucial time, though Vicksburg fell to Grand on the same day. Draft riots were about to break out in this fair city, in my fair city of Boston. The 54th Regiment of Black Volunteers was being armed, not for any abstract sense of racial justice, but for a desperate need for men, for bodies. Uh, Northern victory was not assured. Had it been, as McPherson argues, a war of conquest, the South could not have conquered the North, but it wasn't. As far as the South was concerned, it was hold on long enough to induce sufficient war weariness to get the North to recognize boundaries, and it almost happened. McPherson argues powerfully that at least up until the reelection of Lincoln in 1864, it could easily have gone the other way, and we have that sense. We know why the South lost. The whole set of errors, not taking the high ground at the beginning, Chamberlain in the 18th Maine held Little Round Top, and Lee thought the Northern Battery had gone silent because they'd knocked it out, but it hadn't. So he knew he'd made a mistake the minute he heard the cannon firing on the men. And we know why it happened, but the explanations aren't laws of nature. They're particulars of history. The battle could have gone the other way, and all of American history might have been different. We are comfortable with that mode of explanation for human history. We should be just as comfortable for life's history and for the origin of us as human beings. You see, but unfortunately, the other viewpoint is encoded into our iconography. We see the history of life as the cone of increasing diversity. From a common point of origin, which is a correct view on evolutionary theory, things move up and out. They're very narrow at the base. So at the base, you can just have a few lineages predictably preparatory to the ones that must come later. Up is only supposed to mean geologically younger, but it's so easy to conflate with higher on the ladder of being. And so things move up and out towards necessary progress and diversification. These are stand that was a stand pardon me, that was a standard textbook picture. This is the first great tree of life, Ernst Haeckel, 1866. Let me show you why it is a biased iconography, in case you never recognized it. Problem is that you're forced to put on the top where there's most space the group that you think is maximally advanced. But what if that group is not very diverse? As in this case, Heckel has a conventional view that mammals are most advanced. Folks, there are only 4,000 species of mammals. That's not very many. There are a million described species of insects. Heckel spreads mammals across the entire top of the tree, which goes from wallfish and hooftier, whales and undulates on the left, through people in the middle, through fledemoys, a raubtier, a bats and carnivores. But all of insects, all of those million species, are on one little branch here. <laughs> one little branch, because that's all the room he has lowered down in their zoological status, but it has to be shared with others. This is a biased iconography that promotes the uh, predictabilist, ameliorative view. That's why the replacement by another iconography is so vital. I suggested this alternate iconography in Wonderful Life at the bottom, in which you still have the common point of ancestry, but then a maximal spread of lineages. Now, you could say that, and, and then only a few of the initial possibilities survive, though those few may be enormously successful, so you end up with more species than you ever had, but restricted to a few groups. Now, that's subject to a conventional predictabilist reading, namely there was a grand struggle for cause during this early period, and the good guys won. But it's also subject, as the conventional iconography is not, to a radically different contingent-based explanation in which all you get is a, is a lottery ticket in the greatest lottery ever held on the history of this planet, and that the survivors are effectively those who were fortunate 
And I think the evidence of the Burgess Shale, the great soft-bodied fauna of the early days of life's history supports that point of view. I don't have time to give you the rationale, but only to show you some of the organisms. In this one fauna from the early history of multicellular life 530 million years ago in Western Canada, we have, look, arthropods are 80% of animal species. There are three major groups of arthropods today. Insect group, spider scorpion group, and the uh, marine group, crustaceans, lobsters, shrimp, barnacles, etc. In the Burgess Shale, there, there are 12 to 20 additional arthropod groups that didn't make it, including Marella here, including this most complex of all Cambrian arthropods, Leoncoilia, which left no descendants. And then you get a whole series of creatures, which is so bizarre we don't know how to classify them. Uh, this is Opabinia with five eyes and this vacuum cleaner-like nozzle which folds around to bring food to a central mouth. This is Nectocaris, looks like a chordate behind and an arthropod up front. This is Odontogryphus, a flat, gelatinous, annulated creature with a row of soft tentacles around a central mouth. This is Dynamiscus, a rooted creature. And this, the greatest of all, is Anomalocaris, up to two meters long, the largest of Cambrian organisms. A pair of feeding appendages that look like arthropod bodies, but nothing else about the creature spells arthropod. Up front, bringing food around to a lower mouth, which works on the camera constriction rather than the hit and the hinge jaw principle uniquely among animals. Fantastic set of alternate possibilities, and we don't know why they didn't make it. I recognize the limits of negative evidence, but we have no argument that the ones who made it made it because, in the conventional sense, of predictable superiority. In the Burgess Shale is this very insignificant creature named Pikaia, as I like to say the one name you might want to remember, P-I-K-A-I-A, -I -I because Pikaia is the first chordate, the first member of our phylum. I don't say it's the only chordate then in the world. I don't say it's our direct ancestor. But boy, if you'd gone back 530 million years, I don't think you would have dubbed the chordates as a group with enormous probability for success. If, like most groups in this lottery, they had died, all of vertebrate history is wiped out of the fossil record. All of us, from trouts to hippopotamuses to all of us. The theme of contingency is fractal. It's not only at this grandest. Let me turn that off. That's it for the slides. It's not only at this grandest level, it, it works down every sequence of scales. The asteroid wipes out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, doesn't hit. It's still a world of dinosaurs, and mammals are still little creatures in the interstices of their world. Why not? That's what it had been like for 100 million years before. It's only been 65 million years since. So, Why do we do this old back reading? I th I'm really coming to the end now. It's a view from fear, I think, primarily. We're so afraid that maybe we are insignificant that we have to spin doctors, I said. The greatest document, by the way, is Psalm 8, not Genesis 1. Psalm 8, the expression of fear, first of all. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And how could we mean anything in the face of the heavens? The answer in Psalm 8, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now contrast that with Darwin's answer to the same question, what is man? A great letter to Asa Gray in 1860, where Gray writes to him and says, look, Darwin, I can accept the principle of natural selection. It makes sense, but I cannot avoid the conclusion that there must be some deep God-given meaning to the totality. Darwin writes back, you may be right. Science can't adjudicate big issues like that anyway. But he says, even if that's so, he says, with the details, whether good or bad, this is a quote, being left to the workings out of what we may call chance, by which he does not mean chance, randomness, technical sense. He means contingency, as I use the term, because that's clear from the rest of the argument. He then goes on to make a brilliant set of points to try and lead Gray towards the position that we're an accident, we're a contingent product of history. He says, look, Gray, if a man is caught in a thunderstorm on top of a mountain, is hit by lightning, and dies, he died for cause. There is a reason based on the physics of lightning. But no one would say that it was meant to be in some cosmic sense. It was an accident that he was there. 
That's for the death of an, of an individual. How about the birth of an individual? A child is born with terrible mental retardation. There is undoubtedly some reason that we do not yet know in the mechanics of development. No one, if God be just, would claim that this was meant to be. It happened, it was an accident. That's individual life and death. How about the death of a species? Death of a species is accident. Species become extinct. Well, if the death of a species is an accident, then the birth of a species is an accident too, and humans are species like anything else. So from the death of a man by lightning on a mountain, which is clearly contingency, Darwin has subtly led Gray towards an acceptance of humans as one of the contingent details. Remember what he said, with the details, whether good or bad, being left to the workings out of what we may call chance. The realm of details is enormous, and it includes the birth of us. I suggest to you it also includes most of these grand questions of philosophy, politics, etc. So I want to end with my favorite little sonnet from Frost, which is one I've used before, if I can find it, because it is just a brilliant sonnet on the issue of uh, how can we deal with the issue that the human life or the design of nature might be designed because everything, there are so many horrible things. It's, it's like Gray's point, there's so many horrible things out there in nature. If we have to say they're a result of design, how can we honor anything? Frost's answer is they're not, they're details, they're in the realm of contingency, or at least he suggests it. What he talks about, he's taking a walk and he notices a scene which is quite remarkable. That is, there's a heel all, a flower, which is usually blue. But this one's white, so that's rare. And on it, he sees the wings of a moth that's been eaten. And they're white. And it's been eaten by a white spider. There aren't many white spiders. And the spider is still there. So you have these three white objects with different geometries, the starburst of the flower, the solidity of the spider, the two-dimensional structure of the moth wings. They must have some meaning, three white things of different geometries all together. And yet, if it has meaning, what meaning could it be? The moth has been eaten. It's a horrible scene. So he writes. I found a dimpled spider, fat and white, on a white heel all, holding up a moth like a white piece of rigid satin cloth, assorted characters of death and blight, mixed ready to begin the morning rite, like the ingredients of a witch's broth, a snowdrop spider, a flower like a froth, and dead wings carried like a paper kite. What had the, that flower to do with being white, the wayside blue and innocent heel all? What brought the kindred spider to that height, then steered the white moth thither in the night? What but design of darkness to appall, if design govern in a thing so small? You see, the point is that Homo sapiens, that goes back to Darwin on Gray, is also a thing so small in a vast universe, a wildly improbable evolutionary event well within the realm of contingency. Make of such a conclusion what you will. Some find the prospect depressing, I've always regarded it as exhilarating and a source of both freedom and consequent moral responsibility also towards animals. Thank you.